Welcome to Dementia-Friendly Prince George's County, Maryland Northern Sector Webinar Series for Caregivers. Today's topic is Long-Term Care Planning by Mark Gottlieb, sponsored by Prince George's County Government and the Department of Family Services. I do specialize in long-term care, but other facets of the insurance industry as well, uh, not the least of which is Medicare. So I do a lot of Medicare work in the area. I've done some presentations in Greenbelt as well. I was previously in the health services field and uh, I do a lot of education, a lot of speaking. So I'm happy to have this opportunity tonight. Uh, so we'll jump right into it. Topic of long-term care tonight, a uh, very important topic and it grows and grows in importance because not only is the population aging, uh, but a lot of, let's say, people uh, who are moving toward retirement or we'll call them adult children, uh, are also seeking to learn more about the subject, especially since some of them may have seniors in their own family, or in some cases, even their significant others who are experiencing some long-term care issues. So it's really important in my mind anyway, for people to uh, understand the topic and to do their long-term care planning uh, so that it just doesn't sneak up on them. A lot of people uh, kind of ignore the subject. Uh, we are hit by the issue of denial, uh, a lot of confusion about what the product is, a lot of concern about how much it costs. That can sometimes be because the way it was presented by some insurance agents, but uh, that's really another story. Uh, so in any case, it's important that you familiarize yourself with this issue one way or the other. Uh, great challenge, what's the need for care? I mean, am I gonna need long-term care? I know it's around me. Unfortunately, a lot of people have loved ones who did go through a bout of long-term care at some point in their lives. Uh, so that, that should mean, you know, it's hard to deny the fact that it could happen to anyone. Uh, the statistics say 70% of those 65 plus will at some point need some assistance with long-term care needs. Uh, they basically talk about 80% of that care will be informal, meaning given by others, you know, either uh, adult children, either spouses or partners, uh, community members, et cetera, with the other uh, significant portion, 20% falling under what's called formal care, meaning things you will be paying for. Uh, as we'll get into a little bit later, long-term care basically uh, consists of home health care, adult daycare, assisted living, nursing home, and now more significantly all the time, it seems memory care uh, for those with dementia and Alzheimer's. So, you know, we, we need to think about it again uh, we don't know if we're going to need it or not. That's the great challenge in planning for long-term care. Uh, family issues are very, you know, important within the process of long-term care planning. This is an overview of the things I'm going to be speaking about in the coming slides. Looking at the family issues, the community resources, which people should be aware, long-term care is not just a nursing home or an assisted living community. There are really many facets of long-term care at this point. The costs of long-term care, staggering, frankly, and again, people need to prepare for that. Uh, we ought to think about long-term care costs as a component of retirement planning. Uh, and first and foremost, there's always, always still a lot of surveys that say, people say, well, Medicare will help me pay for long-term care, won't it? The answer is no, unfortunately, Medicare does not pay for long-term care, will only cover up to 100 days in a nursing facility after that, you're on your own. Medicaid does help, I'll address that later on. Uh, the resources to pay for long-term care, there are a number of them, including, of course, we need to plan about our own resources. And then, of course, there is insurance, 
and other funding options. So this isn't a long-term care insurance presentation, it's a long-term care planning presentation. So on the family side, really, the need for long-term care creates a lot of emotional and psychological impacts within a family. Uh, if people get hit, it creates a lot of you know, confusion, a lot of dismay uh, when it comes to funding, helping someone fund long-term care. That becomes a major issue uh, among family members. So it's something people ought to get out ahead of just in the event something should occur to avoid that crisis planning. Uh, we ought to certainly be aware of the desires of the person needing care and not, should not be those who are helping to care for a person making all the decisions. The person in need of the care should be the central focus of long-term care planning. Uh, a lot of people within the family say, of course I'm gonna help take care of mom or dad, or yeah, I'll, you know, no problem, I'll be able to come over as often as I have to. Well, it's easier said than done, and people need to just recognize that. A lot of, uh, you know, we all play a lot of roles and responsibilities within our families, and uh, so it's not as easy to say, yeah, I'll take care of it. Uh, may not even be that easy, even if the person who needs the long-term care lives under the same roof. Uh, that again will depend on how much care they need. If it's a matter of assisting someone getting in and out of a bathtub or helping them with a meal, uh, et cetera, et cetera, fine, a family member may be able to handle that. When something becomes more significant, it creates a whole new challenge. In fact, a lot of the caregivers uh, in the informal sense are considered unpaid caregivers because they're doing it on a voluntary basis. It's estimated that there are 53 million unpaid caregivers throughout the country. So it's a very challenging and important topic. Challenges of caregiving are great. They're both physical and emotional in nature. Uh, so, you know, you have gotta take into account whether you have a spouse or partner, what their needs are as well, or that may be the person who has the need for long-term care. And the adult children running their own life, how much can they be a part of the long-term care plan? As a matter of fact, looking at geography, I mean, adult children are showing up anywhere from 15 to 3,000 miles away and uh, in some, cases even farther than that. So even someone being able to run over from uh, Arlington, Virginia to Greenbelt, Maryland to help provide care becomes a challenge. As I mentioned, uh, long-term care is uh, really a large industry and there's a whole service spectrum associated with this topic. Here are, here are many of them. Uh, there are certainly uh, resources to be able to acquaint you with all the different companies, all the different people who are practicing uh, professions that support long-term care. Uh, these are many of them right here. There are some great resources. There's a book called The Pro-Aging Sourcebook, 200-page document, which has listings of, of literally everyone in the senior serving professional field in the area. So from a resource point of view, that's a great place to go. Uh, I know a lot of people always talk about SHIP, but that's mainly related to Medicare, I believe, as opposed to long-term care. In any case, uh, without taking too long, I'm just gonna quickly run down them. There's geriatric care or life care managers who can help people uh, navigate the challenges of, of a long-term care situation. Placement companies, these are just the names of a few of them, which can help people consider where the best environment is to place themselves into or a loved one into the time comes where they need help out of the home. Uh, just a, an enormous number of home care agencies now. That profession has grown dramatically. Uh, elder law attorneys who can help with both the state and Medicaid planning, insurance and financial advisors. I might be one of those on the insurance end. 
uh, assisted living communities. You need to be out of your own home, but you don't have enough medical needs to have to be in a nursing home environment. Assisted living has grown tremendously. There are both small group homes, typically five to eight beds, uh, people living in them. And then, of course, there's the larger, more recognizable communities. So you certainly you know about them, you hear about them. Uh, you know, sponsored by large companies. Uh, memory care communities, as I mentioned, memory care could be in a freestanding facility that's set up so that people can roam without wandering off the premises and be a danger to themselves. There are also memory care units within either assisted living or nursing homes. Hospice care is for those that are terminally ill. Now, with hospice care, Medicare will cover. It's a large program, Medicare with hospice care. And then, of course, there's a whole, whole other industry, you know, the durable medical equipment, the technology that can be helpful, uh, modifying, you know, modification to your home to be able to uh, move around, you know, more easily to be able to make it accessible to you. Uh, typically may not be able to drive anymore. There are companies transporting people. So it's a huge industry. Uh, now, the, the reason it's important to do financial planning when it comes to long-term care, the staggering prices of care, and I guess, you know, again, a lot of people don't recognize it till it happens to them. And then they start making the phone calls, doing the inquiries, and they are like staggered to find out what a significant financial commitment it is to enter into, you know, long-term care professional services. Uh, there's, you know, just incidentals in terms of adaptations, modifications, equipment and supplies, incontinence supplies, even incontinence supplies can become very expensive over time. And as people, lose the ability to totally control uh you know their themselves physically and and can no longer uh you know take care of themselves when it comes to toileting uh you know all of a sudden you're out there buying incontinence supplies and they're not inexpensive but when you're getting now to the formal levels of care the prices are staggering home care Typically, that's what we call personal or custodial care. We're not talking about skilled nurses. We're talking simply about pretty much about AIDS, uh, nursing AIDS, you know, personal care AIDS, call them what you will, geriatric care AIDS. You're looking at the ballpark of 25 to 35 an hour. 350 a day live in is probably as good of a deal as you'll get. So look at that over the course of weeks and a year, you're looking at some serious dollars. Probably the best deal is an adult daycare center where a person can live with someone else, assuming they're not able to just do everything else for themselves on their own. Let's say they live with an adult child who drops them off or uh, they get transport to an adult daycare center which can provide some socialization, some support, some medication management, et cetera. Uh, then you get into the assisted living, you're moving in, you know, you're moving into a full-time assisted living community. You're looking at 5,000, definitely on the low end, typically more associated with the small group homes. It can go all the way up to 10,000 a month. Uh, so, again, we're looking at some very serious numbers. Nursing home, same thing, at least 9,000, probably up to 12. Uh, memory care in that range, or maybe even a little higher, depending on the level of dementia or Alzheimer's, because they require higher levels of staffing. So, this is, you know, long term care is a serious business on all fronts. Uh, a lot of people say, well, I'm not going to think about it, and I've heard how expensive long-term care insurance is. Should I? I'll just self-insure when the time comes. Well, easier said than done, looking at the numbers I just flashed by you. But if you're able to do it, and you're planning, and you want to take long-term care, or, 
you know, planning consideration instead of just saying, well, if it happens, I'll deal with it then. The, you know, here are some things to think about. Okay, I'm just going to self-insure. I don't want to buy any insurance or anything like that. Well, how long might you need care? You know, someone says I'm going to self-insure and I have, you know, $250,000 saved up. So if I need nursing home level of care, you know, I can pay for it for two years or assisted living two to three years. How long might you need care? We don't know. That's the great dilemma of long-term care planning. If you don't need it excessively long, you may be fine. Expectations for growth of investments. The decreases in investments are asset value. I've spoken to a lot of people who just say, well, you know, I'm just going to keep all my money in investments. They're going to grow by X percent a year. Uh, of course, I'm not going to need long-term care till I'm 90 years of age. So that's going to, I say that tongue in cheek, of course. And so it's going to give me all those years of growth and great growth. And therefore, I'll have the money when the time comes to need long-term care. Well, you know, returns on investment are uh, very variable. Uh, we don't know that we might not need some long-term care three years from now instead of 23 years from now. So that money that you're thinking of growing may not have an opportunity to grow. Uh, you know, and that, that's pretty well incorporated into the next bullet. Just quickly be aware of post-tax dollars that will be available. So, okay, I have... Uh, 250,000 saved up in my 401k. That's what I'm going to use to pay for my long-term care. Remember, your 401k or IRA is pre-taxed. Once it comes out, you may have significantly less to be able to pay for long-term care. Just some things to think about if you're trying to self-insure. Uh, what are some of the financial resources and sources of income? Certainly assets and income streams, look at all of that. You know, how much do I have? How much am I gonna need? Something called personal care agreements. You can create a personal care agreement. Let's say an adult child cuts back on working at their full-time job in order to provide you with some assistance and uh, that they need some money and you have some money that you can pay them and with a personal care agreement, that can go towards, uh, what shall we say, decreasing assets that are considered by Medicaid. So if you did have to eventually go and apply to Medicaid to say mom or dad, or at that point myself is going to need nursing home care, uh, Medicaid is an income program, income and assets. And so if you entered into a personal care agreement, the assets are used to pay the family caregiver who needs the money. It also can help uh, lower uh, the amount of money you have for when consideration for getting on Medicaid has some relevance. Uh, plans for selling a home. If yes, the dollars from the sale can pay, for instance, for assisted living. Many people, on the other hand, say if I have a long term care, chronic condition, whatever, I don't want to go anywhere. I want to live in my home. Probably that's the case for at least 80% of people. Well, if that's the case, then you're not going to be able to sell your home and use that to pay for care in an assisted living community. On the other hand, you may live in the home, have value in that home, and you can look into the possibility of a reverse mortgage to get some of that money out to help pay for the home care. There are a number of Medicaid programs. There are programs called Life Care Settlements. There's a lot of ads on television right now talking about Life Care Settlements. You can get basically some percent of money uh, out of the face value of the life insurance. So I have a $100,000 life insurance policy. The Life Care Settlement Company may agree to buy me out for $50,000. They're going to now own the policy. They'll cash it in when you pass. In the meanwhile, you get some money to pay for home care. 
So it's a, it's a thought. You don't get the greatest value on the dollar for it, but when you need money to pay for yourself or a loved one, you look at all ways that you can do that. Certainly life insurance cash values. You have a whole life policy that you bought many, many years ago. You tucked it in the drawer. Uh, go look at what the cash value is uh, 20, 30, 50 years later. Maybe there's some good cash value to be able to extract. And then, of course, insurance can help us to pay as well. When we're talking about long-term care insurance, we're talking, first of all, about paying for a situation that's going to last 90 days or longer. If you have, you know, incapacity for 30 days or you need a hip replacement and you're going to be, you know, sidelined for 30 days, that's not within the definition of long-term care insurance. Uh, triggers for accessing the benefit if, if and when you have a long-term care insurance policy are either the need for assistance in performing two or more activities of daily living, those are listed here on the slide, and or the need for assistance or supervision due to a cognitive issue, again, dementia or Alzheimer's. So you can have need for assistance supervision due to you know, confusion, due to not being able to reason, to uh, function, you know, to, to manage oneself. You could be perfectly healthy, but still need that assistance or supervision. It could be the other way around. You have a, you know, a chronic physical condition which requires your need for care. Your mind is sharp as a tack. Could be either of the two trigger policies. Uh, why should you think about buying long-term care insurance? Again, you know, starting with the, the dollars that I flashed by you earlier on about the cost of long-term care. Uh, certainly some of the major reasons that people buy a long-term care insurance policy, number one, security and peace of mind. You want to know if you need some help, there's an insurance company there to help you uh, to pay for that care to some extent. It, it more or less, given the prices these days, the prices of insurance as well as the prices of long-term care, we're usually looking at long-term care insurance as a hedge against the total cost of long-term care. Meaning, you know, something's going to cost me Six thousand a month, eight thousand a month. Where's that money coming from? Well, maybe, a, hopefully, at least three or four of it is coming from an insurance policy. Then you can try and find that other three or four from, you know, savings, investments, uh, you know, onward and onward, social security, whatever. But we're we're trying to find many pieces, you know, of income to be able to pay for long-term care. Helps avoid dependency on others. You're not constantly asking a family member or a friend or whomever to say, you got to help me. I'm having trouble. I can't navigate my own life. You know, if you have some money to help pay for some of those services, that's certainly a great uh, situation for you. Protect significant others from the stress of caregiving. Again, there's a lot of studies, AARP. You know, puts them out all the time. There's just an enormous amount of research in the whole field of long-term care, aging, disability, et cetera. And the stress of caregiving on spouses and partners is significant, as well as on adult children. Uh, you know, we also have to be realistic and say, if we live with a spouse or partner, uh, are they going to be there when we need long-term care? And if they are, are they going to be in a situation that they're physically able to help us? Uh, you know, as we age, we all have a little bit more difficulty navigating these challenges. Uh, protecting your assets. Again, if you're getting the insurance company to pay some of that money out, you're keeping whatever assets you need for, again, for your significant others. Uh, so, you know, if you can do that, and that's an aim, that's certainly a nice thing to be able to do. Uh, of course, again, you might buy some long-term care insurance. It's going to fund you for a certain amount of time. Then you may have to go to your assets. So at least those assets will still be there 
while the long-term care insurance is paying out for you. Certainly choices to how and where care is received, uh, you know, having some money in the form of an insurance policy, again, uh, helps you to maybe choose an environment that you, you would enjoy having. Um, you know, one, one point I make uh, on the funding end is when you're talking about affording long-term care, you don't have to buy what's called inflation protection. You don't have to overbuy. I think what I saw in an earlier iteration of long-term care uh, insurance sales is that agents were being told, you know, to basically say, well, look, this is how much people need. They weren't looking at it as a way of hedging your coverage. They were looking at it as a way of, you know, obtaining all your coverage. Well, you the, the more coverage you buy, the more expense it is in terms of premium. And so, you know, you people call agents, get some estimate and forget it, it's too expensive. Well, it, it should have been uh, done in a way that, that helps a person to think about something is better than nothing. You know, this is what I can afford and I'm comfortable with that. But once you tell me it's gonna be an arm and a leg, so to speak, just forget it, I'll take my chances. So. You know, one way I look at that is say you don't have to buy inflation protection. Everyone was conditioned to say, well, the, the dollars that you buy today, if they don't grow while well, the cost of care is going to grow, what's it worth? You know, from my perspective as a conservative agent is it's worth whatever the face value of that amount of money you bought is, even if it's not growing as fast as you'd like it to at least you were able to afford it and you have some help. So there are a number of long-term care insurance options. I really, I do classes where all I do is talking about long-term care insurance. So I get into a lot of detail, whereas this is long-term care planning. So I'm giving you more of an overview. Uh, so, you know, probably a good point to say, and I can say it again at the end, I'm happy to give anyone any information they need about all these different kind of policies, any illustrations, any cost estimates, never any fees or obligation. You know, some people are interested, I give it to them. Well, I can't do it or I don't want to do it. Thanks anyway. That's okay. No obligation. At least you now know what you want to do. Start thinking about your alternatives. That being said, there are two types of long-term care insurance. A lot of people are still not aware of that. Most think of the long-term care insurance as traditional, or I label it as traditional rather than hybrid. By traditional, it means you, the basic, I'm gonna buy a pool of benefits for a certain amount of time, and then you know, I will have it. Uh, the, the cost, you know, if you're looking for uh, quotes, for instance, it's going to be based on your age, obviously, the younger, the better, what your health status is, you know, any particular issues, uh, conditions, uh, diagnoses, etc. What kind of benefit amount? How much do you want the insurance company to help you with if you have a long-term care cost. The, the more benefit you buy, the higher the premium. So let's say you want to buy $100 a day. They will help you with $100 a day to pay. And they base it on what's called benefit length, which is really days of care. So if you use, make it very simple, let's say your benefit amount's 100 a day, Benefit length, they always put it in terms of how many years would you like, okay? It's actually days of care, so I'm going to use three years. I hope I'm not going too quickly with anyone. So let's say I'm going to use three years. That's 1095 days of care, 365 days a year, three years, and 95. And the benefit amount's 100. 100 times 1095, you're going to be buying a benefit pool of $109,500. And there are riders. First of all, there's inflation, which I really should have put on this slide. Inflation, again, means the, the amount you bought will increase in value over time. But of course, you know, the premium is going to be significantly more as a result. 
also something called shared care for instance if you're with a legal partner or a spouse you can buy two pools of money combine them into one so that either can use it it's also something called elimination periods for people who own a policy you know they always need to be aware of this a lot of people might have bought a policy put it in the draw and thought when they have a long-term care need the company will start paying immediately but it depends on what elimination or waiting period you have in your policy so you know if it's a 90-day waiting period that means you're going to have to pay on your own for the first 90 days of care before the company starts paying all right so all that being said what are the two issues about traditional long-term care policies and both of these are reasons why people backed out of deciding not to purchase a policy unfortunately but these are facts of life first is called use it or lose it you're not going to be getting any money back uh, so you know mark gottlieb bought a policy he put in fifty thousand dollars of premium over the years he died mrs gottlieb calls and says okay mark never needed long-term care how much of the 50 grand of insurance that we paid out am i getting back the answer is nothing because you know all everyone's insurance premiums go into one big pool the actuaries have figured out you know what percent of cases they're going to be paying out on etc it's really like health insurance frankly so you paid your premium you were happy that you know you had a, a pretty healthy year you didn't need any major surgery you didn't have uh, cancer and so you only had you know some moderate use you paid you know five thousand nine thousand a year on the policy whatever it was and you go hey i had a healthy year am i gonna get a discount on my next year's premium or am i gonna get any of that money back no because maybe your next door neighbor had the insurance company paying one hundred and fifty thousand out for their treatment so that's just how insurance works. So it's use it or lose it. Some people don't like it. You know, I have to have a traditional policy. I say my benefits are worth a lot more than the money I paid in premiums. If I pass without losing it, not a big deal. If I end up needing long-term care, I'll use the 70% factor, 70% tells me I'm going to need long-term care. I have a nice pool of money to help pay for it. And so my family does not get put into an untenable financial situation. It's number one. Number two, there are future premium increases. You buy a policy, they are able to come back at you in any number of years. It could be three or four years from now. Yeah, Mr. Gottlieb, due to uh, increases in claims that we didn't anticipate, we're going to be asking you to pay 15% more per month on your premium starting 60 days from now. No one likes future premium increases, but we understand that's a, that's a part of the game. But you need to know that before entering into it. There have been situations I tell people, People say, well, you know, I can give you 250 a month, it's pushing it, but it's certainly not going to be any higher, is it? And I say, well, with a traditional policy, I cannot guarantee that three, four, five years from now, you don't get a letter saying that needs to go up. So you need to understand that right now, if that's a big issue for you, it's the wrong product. So because of these two issues, uh the industry really moved into what was called the hybrid life or annuity plus long-term care typically based on a death benefit or face value uh, which is also worth the pool of benefits so i buy a hundred thousand dollar life insurance policy with a long-term care rider at hundred thousand if i don't need long-term care the hundred converts into a life insurance policy my beneficiary will get the hundred if i do need long-term care there's a schedule for how much will be paid out of that hundred thousand per month until it's gone to pay for that 
long-term care that I'm using. It's just an example, obviously. There are a lot of different types of hybrid life. It would you know, take, take certainly more time to explain it than I have tonight, uh, but that's how it works. It's life insurance with a long-term care rider. It's another form of insurance now called an annuity with a long-term care rider. For instance, you can reposition money you have in another investment uh, into an annuity. It'll be that will be the base of the amount of money that will be used to pay for care, but there's also a long-term care rider. So once that first base of money has been used up, it triggers the next pool of money in the long-term care rider. That's very simplistically how it's stated. With life insurance, you can pay for it like any other insurance policy, monthly, quarterly, annually. With the annuity, you do have to reposition a chunk of money uh, in order to, you know, be the base payment for the policy. Uh, so there are a lot of different methods of structuring it. Uh, the one other thing I'd say about all these types of long-term care insurance, there are a number of life insurance policies that are advertised as being offered with a chronic illness or accelerated death benefit rider. They'll typically be less expensive than long-term care. Some agents are kind of uh, representing them to be like a long-term care policy because you can get a certain amount of money out of the policy should you uh, have those triggers we talked about early, like the two of six uh, activities of daily living, and they'll trigger a chronic illness or accelerated death benefit payout. But it can be structured much differently than a true long-term care rider. I try to make that point to people, make sure you recognize the difference between life insurance with a long-term care rider and a life insurance with an accelerated death benefit rider. So with that, you know, why not wait to buy? Uh, at this point, you know, a lot of people tend to defer the situation, you know, maybe next year, I just want to get this set of bills paid for, then maybe I'll do it. But you know, over time, unfortunately, as humans, we all recognize as we age, it's just a much greater chance of, of experiencing an illness, a disabling event, uh, a diagnosis. And at that point, it may put you in a situation where either one, it's going to cause the policy premiums to, to be higher than they otherwise would. Secondly, it could trigger a uh, declination altogether, meaning no thanks, we don't want you, uh, the insurance company finds you to be too big a risk. Uh, sometimes again, consistent with increases in age. Uh, there are certainly a number of select disqualifiers immediately if you call me up and say, I'm, I'm interested in betting the policy, but I'm the first thing I'm gonna ask, okay, what's your, status you know can, can you qualify and there are certain diagnoses where they're going to out and out say no end of discussion there are a number of others that are maybe yes maybe no depending on the, the, the particulars of your case but there are certainly some things that tend to disqualify people uh you know just out and out and you have to think of any other options for financing long-term care. Uh, certainly another reason why not to wait to buy again, the price of policies increase over time, not only due to age, but because the, the companies are increasing premiums, all other things being equal. So two reasons not to wait. If you're truly interested, the time is now. Uh, what else do I do? You know, if I, if I need some care, I don't, have a long-term care insurance policy, I either don't qualify and I don't have enough money to really be able to pay those kind of premiums, what else can I do? Uh, something called non-medically underwritten annuities. These are different than the annuities with long-term care riders. They're simply financial products, annuities, 
Again, you transfer a certain amount of money into the annuity. It will grow over time based on an index, typically. Then when it's time to start withdrawing money, what they might call annuitization, if it's related to the fact that you're going to be using that money because you have a chronic illness or disability and you need to buy long-term care services, these annuities would provide double the annuitized payout. For up to five years. It's one option. Uh, is it as good as a good long term care policy? No, but you're not paying any premiums and you have a chance to get double the annuitized payout for up to five years. So it's not a bad thing. If you don't end up using it, I mean, the annuity was an investment, it still grew based on interest rates. They're all using different types of indexes these days. Uh, there's a veterans aid and attendance program for those who've served at least one day wartime going back to the Korean War and really pretty much up to the present. Uh, veteran aid and attendance program can give you anywhere between 12 and 2700 for home care assisted living, about half of that if it's a surviving spouse. So that can provide, you know, that's something. To look at is is an option. There are a few other community-based veteran programs uh, that are out there. The VA, you know, just has an enormous amount of resources. Uh, there are Medicaid community-based waivers. Again, income requirements for those at lower income levels. There are programs through Maryland in each county that are community-based waivers that can provide some assistance to you in the way of home care if you're considered to you know have the right qualifications from a physical standpoint and also of course once again there are income requirements to qualify for some level of Medicaid assistance. One other thing, which really is quite different than, than strict Medicaid, but they're called Medicaid compliant annuities. In these situations, you're trying to protect money that your family has from having to be spent down paying for nursing home care. You'll, you'll, you'll often see elder care attorneys advertising you shouldn't lose the money you worked hard to pay for if you need nursing home care. They're talking about is getting you approved for Medicaid and also being approved for being able to uh, get a Medicaid compliant annuity. So you take that money, you reposition. It's this again, as it could be a whole hour in itself talking about Medicaid compliant annuities. You take the, the assets, let's say you have 250,000. Well, that'll be gone quick if I'm paying 10000 a month to a nursing home. We've worked hard for that money. We, we figure out a way it works best with a community spouse. Let's say I'm going to be needing nursing home care. We want to preserve the money for my wife. Uh, we work something out that we put the money into a Medicaid compliant annuity. It shifts the asset out of my name becomes an income payment for my spouse. My asset value goes to zero. I am then approved by Medicaid for them to pay for a nursing home. People need to be aware of that. So you are now aware of that. There are a range of other proprietary products, again, which can be of some help, not quite as good as long-term care insurance, but again, you know, we're all looking for any options we can when it comes time to protecting ourselves against long-term care costs. So last but not least, I think we're right on time here at 750. Uh, for those already who own a policy, this comes up quite often. You know, I'll do a presentation and let's say half of the people in the crowd will already own a policy that they bought a number of years ago. What do they need to know in a nutshell? Be aware of what your policy offers. There's something called an outline of coverage that goes along with your policy in the policy jacket. It's pretty boring reading from that point of view, but it's good to know ahead of time what you actually have and what you're paying for. How do they describe 
the type of home care they'll pay for will only be through a formalized, licensed, and certified home health care agency, or will they pay for someone who works in the community? It's hard to find these days, but some of the older policies offer a situation where you could use what's called an informal caregiver to provide that care for you. You can't assume that. You need to read that policy. Activities of daily living versus instrumental activities of the activities, IADLs. So, you know, what are they going to pay for? Is it only going to be for the hands-on care? Or will they allow someone to help you with, let's say, IADLs with uh, doing your bookkeeping, with uh, doing your home cleaning with doing uh, grocery shopping or making meals. So we need to know how they, homemakers, what they will call some of those services, need to read the fine print and who can deliver it. And then again, we talked about elimination periods. Know ahead of time if something would have happened, what's my responsibility relative to the elimination periods? Some policies have two different elimination periods for home care versus facility care. Some will count the days that are paid for home care towards the elimination period for the facility care. Those are just some, some things to think about. The triggers, again, we talked about the triggers with the need for two or more assistance activities of daily living, or how do they define cognitive necessity when it comes to uh, being able to say, okay, you meet the official trigger, we will begin paying from your policy. Has your policy increased in value? You bought the policy a certain number of years ago. Try to figure out if you bought inflation. If so, what type? It could have been inflation based on uh, simple or compound inflation. Could have been 3% growth, could have been 5% growth. The higher the percent, the quicker the policy grew. 5% compound basically means the 15th year from the time you bought it, it would have doubled in value. If I bought $100 a day of coverage 15 years ago with 5% compound inflation, and it's now today worth $200 a day towards paying for care. Good to know about. Uh, how, you know, how does that fit within your, your coverage, your, your needs right now? I mean, okay, is that enough what I have? Or do I, should I be supplementing? What else do I need to be thinking about as to what else I'm going to use uh, to pay for long-term care along with whatever value I've accrued? And finally, and very significantly, if you're facing premium increases, a lot of people get those dreaded letters. We're going to have to increase your premium by X percent, but you can keep the premium the same if you're willing to do any of the following. And a lot of people get confused by this. Of course, you should call the 800 number in your long-term care policy packet and ask someone there, you know, at the at the insurance company to help explain it to you. But I, you know, a lot of people call me. I'll explain it to them just because you know I want to make sure everyone knows what they're doing. Uh, you know, they might say, "Well, we'll keep your premium the same, but we're gonna." decrease the, the years or days of coverage you have down. So you're willing to, you know, pay a little less, you know, keep the premium the same, but then lose this much of your coverage? I don't know. I personally don't like it. Decrease the accrued daily benefit. Mr. Gottlieb, you're based on inflation, your policy has grown from 150 to, you know, 250 but you don't want to pay any more premium, we'll take the 250 it's grown to and back it down to 212. You're willing to lose $32 in value on that policy a day? Uh, you know, for how many years would that policy be in, you know, in, in action? Uh, typically, I don't find it to be a very good deal unless you really have no option. Uh, again, 
to me, the probably the most acceptable alternative is altering the type of inflation protection. Maybe your policy has built in some value. You're a little bit older now. You're willing to decrease the 5% growth down to 3% in order not to pay the extra premium. To me, personally, that's the only tenable alternative. Uh, so that's my presentation.